all my invited guests that have come from far and near, those that came from Amsterdam, those that came from the United States, those that came from the Netherlands, and those that came from Medina and Kaswa, due to your part of it. Honorable Susu, thank you so much. I know you are the landlord of this together. Please just come and welcome us once again. Let's go up the now of this table and we'll be right here. Hallelujah. I will, I can, I must. Uh, let me say that these inspiring words from us has been the theme of all my educational outreaches I do in Medina. In fact, what we do our school tours, these are words that we bring in the mind of every individual because I myself have seen the power of mentorship and how God is able to transform people from one direction to another. I've seen how I grew up on the streets of Accra, begging, uh, sometimes begging for arms before going to school when I was at St. John's Grammar School. And even when I was the senior voice prefect of St. John's Grammar School, I was just sleeping in a kiosk at Kotobabi, opposite the Kotobabi police station. And every morning I would walk from Kotobabi police station to Caprat. Uh, sometimes Aladu Junction to get a car to St. George Grammar School. But if God can move me from a child living on the street without any hope to becoming a lawyer and then becoming a member of parliament, it means that God can do anything possible. So I say that, why society What is the
sorry to say, a political statement, but he has proven to be a man of his words. And we are excited. But Tosnani called me and told me how we had a nice time with you last week. And I want to say thank you so much on behalf of the whole board of the ambassadors that we do appreciate you. Please, with an higher shout, with a standing ovation. No, 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 no. With an higher shout, with a standing ovation, help me welcome His Excellency.
the award ceremony uh, of Akin Adesina, the Afghan Development Bank President. You have been awarded the Family Award, the highest award, and he invited me to be present. And uh, I got to the airport, and Stanley had lined up a fleet of bulletproof cars. He gave me red carpet presidential treatment, even though I'm a former president in, in opposition. And he took us to his hotel. And for any of you who see if you can afford it, ask for Delboro uh, Hotel. And uh, it's a beautiful experience. And you know what? It was all free of charge. They didn't take one single night. Accommodation, they took me in the presidential suite. Um, you must all aspire to stay in that suite one day. <laughs> but uh, it's a heavenly experience. So we're happy to be here. Let me first apologize for our later run. We were supposed to be here by 12, and I think it came about an hour later. Um, we were having a meeting with um, the FinTech uh, companies, and um, it got quite a bit lively and exciting. Uh, by the time I was leaving, there were still maybe about 30 hands up wanting to make suggestions and uh, comments and ask me questions. But I, I said that I had an equally important uh, event and we were waiting for me and so on. So let me begin by thanking my friend and brother, President Pastor Brian Martin and the leadership of the International Youth Empowerment Summit, IS, for the invitation to be part of this celebration. I want to congratulate him and, and the President of the International Youth Empowerment for setting up an outstanding foundation that has positively shaped lives, impacted generations, and is today commemorating its 10th anniversary, so every 10 years. Congratulations for that. What IS has accomplished is all the more commendable given that the foundation is a non-profit, non-governmental registered youth organization which has the sole and noble objective of inspiring and empowering the youth to greatness. I wish to express my greatest pleasure at being part of this impact, a confluence of brilliant minds and experiences reflecting a shared commitment to fostering positive change and making a lasting difference in the lives of young people. According to the 2021 Population and Housing Census, Ghana's population age structure has moved from one that was dominated by children who are categorized in the age group between 0 and 14, to one dominated by young people, and when we talk about young people, is the people within the age group 15 to 35. And this has become the largest uh, population group in our country, according to the 2021 uh, census. According to the census statistics, the proportion of children, that's a 0 to 14, declined from 41.3% in 2000 to 35.3% in 2021. While that of young people, that is between 15 and 35, um, uh, in, in 2000, increased um, by, to 38.2% in 2021, making it the new majority age group. So while children 0 to 14 currently stands at 35 and three, um, young people aged 15 to 35 stands at 38.2. One of the reasons that I'm particularly excited and personally uh, have a vested interest in the development and success of young people in Ghana is that I'm also going to represent the youth age barriers, with the youngest of them being uh, 16, that's Lady Karina, and there's one of them here, Sharaf, that's very something. Um, that's the third point. And so my children fall within that, that group, and so I have a vested interest in making sure that young people of that age are able to live and recognize their full, to realize their full potential. <laughs> Ghana today is at a crossroads, and we face a bankrupt economy uh, due to poor leadership, and uh, it's plunging the nation into poverty and chaos. 
While it is bad enough that the Kenyan national unemployment rate stands at a staggering 14.7%, and this is the recent statistic that was released by the Ghana Statistical Service. With youth un 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 unemployment significantly standing at over 30%, that means over 800,000 Ghanaians have also been pushed below the poverty line. And so this remains a time for waiting to explode and blow this nation up if we do not take the steps to fix it right away. The interesting thing about the statistic is also that the highest rate of unemployment is beginning to occur amongst people with a tertiary education. And so you are being punished for the higher you go. And so if you end up in university or a tertiary education school, your chances of getting a job are less than somebody who has a secondary school education and uh, below. And that is a very uh, alarming statistic. There is immense potential in our youth and boundless opportunities for them. I therefore wish to express my happiness that they are developing and positioning themselves through innovative programs like the IES. Coming from a social democratic uh, tradition, I wish to stress the importance of inclusiveness and bridging the inequality gap across all demographics. I am an advocate for investment in people as well as the provision of essential structures and services to harness the potentials of our young people for national development. While it is the duty of the youth to dream, it is also the duty of responsible governments to provide that fertile and enabling environment that will enable the youth to break barriers and accomplish those dreams. It is in this light that the next NDC government has lined up a number of policies and programs that are tailored to the total development and harnessing of the potential of our young people so that they too can be leaders as the primary objective of leadership is to make more leaders and not more followers. I also wish to emphasize that their leadership mindset will be vital in restoring our country back to the path of shared growth. We are committed to an all-round education system from basic to tertiary. And we also are committed to skills and technical training as a pivot for economic transformation, free tickets, free national apprenticeship programs, etc. And I'm happy to have Dr. Nanaki Makoka as my running mate. And to say that as an educationist herself, who was the first female. Of a public university, and um, she's been a teacher all her life. And I also have the privilege of having her serve as my minister uh, for education. She understands the sector very well, and I believe that when we win, I didn't say the eighth one will win. And I saw you. Yeah. And I saw you on seven January. She will have oversight over the education sector, youth empowerment, women empowerment, health sector. She will have direct oversight over that those sectors. And so the youth you are in good hands. And I believe that we will be able to turn the fortunes of our education sector by bring quality at the center of the learning outcomes that our children have. It's not enough to just increase the quantity of children like on a conveyor belt going through the education. They must come out of education with a positive learning experience that skills them up for the world of work. And I'm sure that she will uh, uh, see to that when she comes. Technical and vocational education training will be completely free. And then we'll also introduce the free national apprenticeship program. There are many of the children who fall through the cracks, even at the basic level. They are not able to continue into secondary for some reasons uh, that are unavoidable. And, and then, after secondary education, many are not able to continue into tertiary education, so they come out of school. Um, it's not that they do not have a talent, and I've said several times that 
If you take two children, maybe you do this, belonging to the same parents, and you put them in the same class, you find that one is very quick to learn and to catch everything the teacher said. Another one is slow, and often we say in uh, our local uh, language, Wabong, that's what they will say. And it becomes a stigma against that child. But you take those same two children and put them in an environment where they have to learn a skill with their hands. And you find that the one you said Wabong will catch it faster than the one who uh, is uh, taught to be more uh, intelligent. And so every child has his talent. You must let every child be able to realize their full potential. <laughs> and so the free national apprenticeship program will be administered through the district assemblies. And what the government will do, our government will do, is that we will register all the master class people in the district. They must have a uh, a conducive environment for teaching and practices. It doesn't mean if you have some tree or you, are, uh, uh, you have your shop like some uh, uh, dirty daughter or something, you will just uh, recruit you. You must have a decent place where the children can learn a trade. And so when we've registered them under the National Apprenticeship Program, the money will be released to the district assemblies and will be given to the master craftsmen so that they can train the children so that we take the learning of the children. And this will give all children an opportunity either to pursue an education to, to their potentials can uh, uh, sustain it or to learn a skill and a trade when they come out of school. One of our pivotal policies is going to be the 24 hour economy policy. And we believe that as a key policy, it is going to change the structure of our economy. It is a policy that will promote inclusivity, around the clock business, operations, and accessibility by providing uninterrupted access to critical services such as healthcare, education, transport, and entertainment. Places like the ports are going to be made to work 24 7 and to also open on weekends. People must come to work on Saturday and Sunday to declare a piece of the report. This will involve recruitment of more security personnel and equipping our security uh, services with the right equipment to make sure that there's a safe environment for the 24 hour economy to be able to take place. It will ensure enhanced safety and, and increased security presence and will also promote active vibrant day and night activities. We will also invest in the transport sector so that we make the transport sector more efficient. We try to introduce the Ayaluno Pass service, which was a fast rapid transit system. Unfortunately, we left office uh, when the buses had come. And uh, before we could launch it, a new government came and uh, they discarded the deliverables of those buses back. We're going to take all those buses, we're going to rehabilitate them, we're going to put them on the road so that people can communicate. We believe that we must invest in infrastructure that is transform transformative. And so we believe we must put money in key infrastructure that will help to turn our economy around. And that's why we have a program called the Big Push. And the Big Push is going to be uh, funded through many sources. But one of the, more, the principal sources for the Big Push is going to be the annual budget funding amount, which is the share of our oil revenues that go into the budget. It will be strictly dedicated to uh, transformative uh, infrastructure that includes uh, railways. It will include dualizing the road to major cities like from Accra to Kumasi. It will have a three lane, a uh, six lane uh, dual carriage uh, will be Accra to uh, Cape Coast, Accra to Aflao, and other places will have. And this will help to reduce the rate of accidents because one of the major causes of accidents on our road is wrong food overtaking. And because we have a single carriageway, uh, when somebody tries to overtake wrongly, there's a head on collision and people die or are injured. We're also going to uh, invest part of the money 
in development of the ICC sector. And when I was with the FinTechs, I told them we're going to establish a FinTech growth fund and we're going to put $50 million for all FinTech startups. So you young people who come out of school. All you young people who come out of school and you want to go into the FinTech sector and set up ICT driven uh, startups, you will get a little push to be able to, to do so. Agriculture is going to be one of the major uh, uh, pillars of our new administration. And I've said that we're going to name the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, the Ministry of Food and Agribusiness. It is not just about growing food, but it's about approaching agriculture as a business. And so all of you who are interested in that segment, you must start preparing your minds for it. And that is the segment that completes the value chain of agriculture. In the past, all our programs of quality of food and jobs, met us safe, and all the other programs that have been conceived have been conceived to give assistance to farmers to produce more. But it does not consider what happens to the farmer after they get produced. There are no more changes because the agribusiness sector has not been promoted enough. And so we're going to give support to young people to go into agribusiness. You can buy soya bean and have a processing plant where you produce soya oil. The cake that is left on the soya bean, you can do it into poultry feed and present it to the market. There are so many things that uh, we can do. And we will go after this slide a little bit. The next agency government will launch a program akin to the Operation Feed Yourself and Operation Feed Your Industries program of the early 70s. Many of you were not, your, 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 your parents have not even uh, decided to meet, to even conceive you, so you probably will not know about Operation Feed Yourself and Industries. But this was during the Achapon regime, and it was a deliberate policy to get Kenyans interested in agriculture and make Ghana more self-reliant. If you are self reliant nobody can depict you. Today, the reason we are being threatened about LGBTQ is because we depend on others for funding different kinds of programs and things, and that is why our president is reluctant to sign uh, St. George's uh, <laughs> And so we took responsibility to 
said, okay, uh, do so as the reality will take responsibility, even though the challenge had come over a period. There had not been enough generation, uh, investment in generation, and also uh, a debt had been accumulated because the independent power producers were not being paid on time. But it all crystallized when the Western Bank of Africa was broken. Today, some submarine came out to, I don't know whether some whales or marine spirits went under. But they want to bring the undersea optical fiber cables. And so you will notice that you're having problems with your in the internet. At the time, the Western Bank gas pipeline was broken. I said that it was an act of God, and it was not the uh, um, uh, cause, it wasn't caused by any particular person. And they said, no, 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 you are president, you are responsible. You are responsible for the likes of uh, Today, Mr. Digital, I don't know if you will say, <laughs> He is responsible for our uh, inability to access the internet. But I'm an honest and truthful person. It's an act of God. And uh, we we'll, we'll hope that it's fixed as quickly as possible. And so let me congratulate IS once again, and wish uh, Pastor Brian and the leadership, the mentors, and the mentees every success in all your endeavors. And please know that. You have our support, and that, I mean, in government, we will continue to collaborate with IS so that we're able to mentor young children and give them